Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to start my presentation now if I. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. okay, so my name is Alex Sassmanshausen. Uh, I'm going to be presenting Gal Config, which is a little library that I'm writing or have written. It's just about ready to be released. Um, it's kind of possibly more, the presentation is probably going to be more high level than the other presentations we've had so far. So yeah, I'm Alex Sassmanshausen. Uh, in my spare time, I just like to hack in Gal, and I work for PTFS Europe, which is a pretty cool company. Um, they kind of supply uh, software to primarily free and open source software to like academic, public, and specialized libraries. And I get to work with the Koha ILS community, which is a great community, so if you have a chance to hang out with people from there, do, they're all lovely. So, I have an elevator pitch. Uh, basically, the aim of, okay, I'll just go through the page, elevator pitch. You know the situation where you're kind of trying to write a command line utility, you kind of have an awesome idea for a quick little program that does one thing and it does it well, and you kind of start working and you make great progress and you have a prototype version and it kind of works wonderfully. And then you, know, you get some people to start using it and they kind of point out a different use case. Um, and then you kind of find like, okay, well maybe that use case could require a command line flag, so you know, maybe I'll just build that in and then people can specify that on the command line. So you know, you add command line parsing. Yay, problem is solved. <coughs> But then you find that there's another bit in your program that actually really, it should just have a default, a user-defined default value. So you can use an environmental variable or you can use a configuration file. Okay, so what we do is in this case, we just write a config file reader. We, you know, we have a configuration file somewhere, we just read it, we parse it, and we use that as a default value. Wonderful. Then the user doesn't have to specify it in the command line every single time they run it. Yay, simple. But then, you know, some, some people then start complaining that, you know, actually the configuration file isn't there by default, they don't really know what syntax it's supposed to have, so really, uh, it's, it's all quite opaque. So then what you do is, well, similar problem, you create a, you know, a config file that is automatically written, uh, you make sure that it's created when it doesn't exist on the first time you run it, and then you kind of add common syntax to the configuration file to make sure that people understand the configuration file when they actually look at it and start to modify it. So suddenly you moved from, oh, I'll just do a quick you know, few lines of code to now you're also parsing configuration files and you have a comment syntax and you co parse command line things. So it's great fun. You're kind of simple program that does one thing and does it well, suddenly has all this kind of code that is a pain to maintain basically. Yay, fun. And now you've got like a whole maze of command line arguments and you don't even know how it works anymore. You were the one who wrote it, so you're totally confused. Uh, so, you, you know, this is where the help command line, the help flag that pretty much all command line programs support needs to come in, so you need to write that. So that's what you do. You support, you write support for another command line option, in this case, the help, the help flag, and then you write the most beautiful help output that you've ever seen. Very clear, super wonderful. And then you watch it burn as soon as you add another command line option. Or, you know, you now have some documentation to maintain in the help output in the configuration file where you write your commentary to help people, and also in your manual, which of course you maintain because manuals are important, right? So you've got three things to maintain now, and your code has become even more complicated. This is, this is really depressing. So, okay, well at least we've got the problem solved. No one's going to complain about this, right? It's great. But, you know, your simple command like you said, you can't even quickly see what side is written anymore, and there's so much code going around that is totally irrelevant to actually the actual thing that you want to do. It's, I mean, it's not really a solution, I think. So it's really horrible. But hey, Gal Config, a new library, that could solve your problem, maybe. That's Smiley, by the way. I just, it was the first Smiley, I did a search for like Smiley celebration, that was the first Smiley I came up with. So I was just like, well, that's a weird Smiley to come up there, so I have to include it. Uh, so, okay, as a background, Gal basically comes with a uh, library, much like Perl also has a kind of get up long library, probably all kind of languages nowadays do. Gal has i9 get up long, which is great. It, it's, it allows you to kind of specify command line arguments, and then it kind of allows you to parse those command line arguments as they come into your program. It's really nice, um, and I use it all the time. And this is an example of it. So basically, you can see at the top there, you've got the specification of the command lines that you support, the command line arguments you support, and what kind of features they support. So for example, you have help, which uh, is the long version, and then you've got this as a single character, a short version, you've got h, and then the value, you know, it doesn't require a value, it's just a flag. And you can go through that. There's a, there's a grammar for that, it's documented in the manual, it's quite easy to use. And then underneath that, you need to instantiate it. So when you actually run the program, you uh, define opts to be, you know, your command line syntax, which is defined as option grammar there. 
and then you pass the program arguments to get the long, and that basically parses the command line arguments, and then you can just query the result to see whether someone has asked for help, and then if, you, if they have asked for help, you can uh, emit usage or whatever with a help, mess, help function in my case, or if they've asked for version, you can emit uh, version using a helper function there. And at the bottom, you can basically start, you know, do the rest of your program. So it, it's, a, it's a relatively decent way to do it, but essentially, essentially, it just addresses the first part of my elevator pitch. It's, you know, someone wants to have a command line option, you add it using get up, not, get up long. That's just the first part of the problem. So what this library is supposed to do, it basically is supposed to build on that. Um, and it does that by basically using get up long as a kind of lower level, as a library, uh, retaining its goodies in a sense. But then on top of that, it expands the, the grammar for specification of options. So that some options you can now basically specify that they can be specified in configuration files as well on command line. Um, it automatically creates configuration files. It automatically parses configuration files if they exist. If you have a program that doesn't need configuration files, then none of that will happen. Um, you can automatically generate help usage and version from your option specification. Uh, and you can even, uh, inside your specification, declare that you want to have a subcommand. For example, Geeks has import as a subcommand or uh, package as a subcommand. So you can specify subcommands as part of your um, application, with, which again, in turn, have nested kind of um, command line flags or further subcommands. So this is the example. Um, it's, uh, it's slightly less elegant at this point, I think, syntax-wise, than, uh, than get up long. And part of that is just because it does so much more. So obviously, if you need to get more information in there, it's going to be less concise. But the idea is basically that you have a configuration. In this case, it's for a program called Backup Monitor. It's got a little you know, explanation of what it does. It's a configuration for Backup Monitor. And then you just have a list of options. So you've got at the top there a, another configuration for a subcommand called Rule World, which sounds quite nefarious. Uh, and then you've got an open option, for, uh, which is called Base, which is apparently a base directory for the backups. And then you've got a predicate, which is another option, in this case, a public option. You can see that the open options basically specify configuration files and command line options, and public options specify just command line options. Um, and then underneath that, you just have a few more kind of keywords for that kind of uh, configuration definition. So you can say where the configuration directory, so where the configuration files should be created. In this case, it's in the home folder under subdirectory called backup monitor. It kind of has a longer explanation, which will be added to, con to the configuration file that's generated. And then there you can see that basically we ask for help to be automatically generated and usage to be automatically generated. It has an author and a copyright date and a license. Uh, two more fields that you can't see now, unfortunately, because it's off screen. So it's basically just specifying what I've just said. Configuration files are basically root configurations or subcommand spe uh, specifications. And then private options are kind of basically, you can say, there's this option that need to, needs to be referenced, but it's only internal. Like users don't need to change that option. So that's a private option. Um, and public options are command line options. So that's the bit that get up long does at the moment, just the public options. And open options are command line options, but also they're specified in configuration files. Uh, so, yeah, and this is, this is an example of it being instantiated. So where before you basically had, so it's, I mean, it still looks very similar in the sense that you still have the kind of get up config auto, uh, which is assigned to ops after passing a pro program arguments and config configuration and your configuration declaration. But you don't have to worry about like doing the whole kind of checking for version, checking for usage, checking for um, help anymore, because that's done automatically. Uh, and then you can just start doing your stuff. And you can use the same syntax as with get up long, which is the option ref. It's basically a thing that allows you to check for options that are, that are being passed in. So yeah, let's, let's quickly look at an example. Uh, so this is the example help output for backup monitor, which is the program we just saw the configuration specification of. You can see basically it generates the kind of usage line with short options and some example values, and then kind of has a lo the, the long version as well, which is with the kind of summary that it says in the configuration specification as well. So we can see here that, you know, help, display help message and exit, or, you know, we define predicate. So set, the test, set test to success, test or failure. So it kind of generates that from the uh, configuration specification that we have. You can also see that there's a subcommand rule world. Ah, plan x-ray. Hmm, wonder what that does. So now you can just go, well, it's a subcommand. It should have the same rules, so... Ah, there we go. We get another help uh, function because, again, it's a nested configuration, so we can just understand it that way, and we get the same thing. 
So that's what it does essentially. And hopefully it does it well. One thing and doing it well. <laughs> that's the aim anyway. So it creates configuration files, it kind of reads configuration files. There's quite a lot of I.O. going on there. So maybe there's a question about the functional paradigm, which is encouraging I.O. I mean it's obviously it's a multi-paradigm language, so you can do whatever you want, but I at least like the functional paradigm, so I kind of tend to follow that. So I mean, the thing with option parsing and configuration file reading, file reading is generally the very first thing you do in a program. So it generally, you can basically have, um, and, and that, that part is the part that really kind of contains the kind of I.O. operations. So by having that as the very first thing you do, using this library, you can basically, you can really easily maintain a functional core, which is where you actually do your logic, and it's just wrapped in that imperative, you know, that let basically, that does the kind of parsing of the configuration files and configuration options. And there's also two approaches. I'm, I'm, you know, experimenting with monads, which is proving painful, but also exciting. So uh, I've actually, like, I'm using this thing which I call the I.O. monad, which is basically, it's a different style you can use. I showed you basically the kind of get along style, which is kind of the standard style. Um, the I.O. monadic style basically uses, uh, builds on kind of Ludovic's implementation of the kind of monad functionality in Guile, which he uses for geeks. I'm kind of using it for something else. Uh, and it's basically just a really, because Guile supports I.O. operations natively, so it doesn't, it doesn't really need it. But it's just a kind of somewhat computationally expensive way to maintain in your head clear boundaries between I.O. and functional operations. Whether it's useful is up to you. I mean, I think it's quite useful, but you could say that the price is too high. Um, then th that's a, basically the overview of what kind of this thing does. I don't know how I'm doing on time. I think I'm doing all right, actually. Yeah, five minutes. Perfect. So, like I said before, the declarative specification grammar is not super yet, so I'm kind of thinking about how to improve that. Um, I'm a bit worried about kind of releasing 0 0.1 if I'm going to rewrite this, because you know obviously that would kind of break things a little bit. But I'm so I might just release 0 0.1 anyway. Um, and uh, there are a few issues with the get up long library at the moment because it actually at points just exits. Um, for example, like get up long kind of allows you to check with predicates whether the incoming value matches what you expect it to match. So you could, for example, check for specific values. Like if you want input to either be success or failure, like the string's success or failure, um, then get up long can check whether it actually matches success or failure. But at the moment, if it doesn't, then it just exits the program. And really what it should do, or at least for my purposes, what it should do is throw an error so I can catch it and then actually do some more processing. So I might hopefully, and you can hold me to this if you want, uh, submit patches to the Gao community to try and implement that. Um, uh, and there are also some corner cases. There's the whole kind of, well, there's a question of what happens if you have name collisions uh, somewhere in the configuration, nested configuration. I haven't actually tested that yet, so I should probably kind of do some testing, or I might just not do it, and if someone runs into it, they can tell me, and then I can work it out. And there's also the special kind of dash dash command line option, which many programs support, which is basically means stop processing command line arguments and take the rest as input to the program. Uh, that's not supported at the moment. Uh, and yeah, there's also questions about positional arguments, or arguments that don't actually have a flag. You, you know, you have a program that just, um, you know, just literally expects, let's say, the target file name. So you just literally pass the file name as the first argument. You don't actually have a name for that argument. It's just a, it's just a positional parameter. Um, I'm not doing anything clever with that, but, and, I, and I think there's potential for doing clever things with that as well. So I might look into that, but that's for the future. You can get it, at the moment it's hosted on GitHub, which I have a love-hate relationship because it's super simple, but it's ambivalent on free software things. But you know, on, it's, it's doing the right things in some ways, uh, it's, but it's not like entirely free software. So I'm ambivalent towards it. It's really easy to use. You can get it from there for now. Um, and you, you can basically do the, the usual thing. If you clone the directory, if you clone the repository, you can do auto-reconf and then configure and then make install and then it's fine. Or make and then make install. Um, and I also have an experimental geeks recipe, which as well, I will be submitting once I've released 0.1 fully and actually have an archive with the release tarball, so I'll submit that to Geeks as well. And then we can just use it that way. And I think that's it. Dance of joy to end with. Yay. <laughs> so, any questions? Anyone? You know? Yeah. Uh, what about internationalization? How does it work? Uh, I have not focused on internationalization at all yet. Um, so I guess it's for the configuration specification. That's where internationalization is important because that's where it parses the strings. Yeah, actually, that's a good point. I had not considered that yet. I thought it was an internationalization-free program, but it's not. You're right. I should implement that.
I can use the wonderful get text module that's part of Guile as well for that, I would think. So I will do that. Good point. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alex. <laughs>